Today on Investigate TV, so-called forever chemicals found in drinking water across the country. We don't know the complete like scope of how this will affect our bodies, how it will affect our babies. And those dangerous toxins are also turning up in freshwater fish. So the longer an animals live, the higher up on the food chain, generally uh, the more contaminated they're gonna be with uh, PFAS. Investigate TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to Investigate TV. Researchers are quite literally fishing for answers. They're trying to find out just how much contamination waterways have from a group of cancer-causing toxins known as forever chemicals. Andy Parati went out with a group looking to quantify the amount of PFAS chemicals in freshwater fish, a concern for both wildlife and people. Damon Mullis cruises on a South Georgia river in search of fish deep below. Probably 20, 25 foot in some areas of the deepest. About 25 miles from the coast on the Ogeechee River in Savannah, passing sunbathing reptiles, waterfowl, and swamplands along the way. What kind of fish are we looking for? Uh, red breast sunfish is what we're targeting. And it doesn't take long. Oh, got you got one. Got for us to make our first catch. That's what we're looking for, red breast. The plan isn't to eat the fish, but to test them for a cancer-causing toxin called berfluoroalkyl, or PFAS for short, used by manufacturers for decades to make products water and oil resistant, like nonstick cookware, carpet, and food packaging. Scientists call it the forever chemical because it does not break down naturally. Last year, a study by the Waterkeeper Alliance discovered the chemical in the Ogeechee River and other rivers in Georgia, including the Chattahoochee. The Ogeechee is the site of the largest fish kill in the state's history, caused by water discharges from a now closed textile plant upstream. So, yeah, we put these chemicals out in the environment, uh, not really understanding their impacts on on the ecology of our systems, but also their impact on human health. And then once they're out there, they make their ways into our body, whether we eat fish or not. There we go. To measure the impact, the executive director of the Ogeechee River Keepers partnered with Georgia Southern University to test the fish for PFAS here at its lab. Each one caught, measured, weighed, and its GPS location recorded. The bigger the fish, the better for testing. Um, so the longer an animals live, the higher up on the food chain, generally uh, the more contaminated they're gonna be with uh, PFAS. It's not just the Ogeechee River potentially contaminated. A study released by the Environmental Working Group earlier this year discovered elevated levels of the chemical in fish from coast to coast. The samples collected by the Environmental Protection Agency discovered PFAS in freshwater fish 280 times higher than commercially raised fish. To put in perspective, the Environmental Working Group estimates eating just one freshwater fish a year could be equal to drinking a month's worth of water laced with the forever chemical. David Andrews is one of the researchers who led this study. This is a significant problem, and this is one that we think should be addressed at both the local and federal level in terms of holding polluters accountable and potentially um, providing guidance to anglers or communities who are, re are relying on these fish. Oh, that's a good one too. Some states have set PFAS limits related to fish consumption, issuing warning signs like these, but Georgia is not one of them. Why? The state's Environmental Protection Division says the states that took action had much higher levels of the toxin, and it's decided to wait until the Environmental Protection Agency releases its PFAS restrictions and testing guidelines. A decision with no set deadline involving an agency with the history of delays. I would love to see a little more urgency from the federal government and the state government. And that's one reason we're doing this project. What's happening here is happening all throughout the, the country. Not doing anything, ignoring it, is not going to help. 
It's estimated that at least 42% of the nation's tap water contains at least one or more PFAS substance. That's according to a comprehensive study by the U.S. Geological Survey. The regulation process for the group of chemicals is ongoing, but experts say there are no, quote, safe levels of PFAS. Meanwhile, some communities are pushing for more testing to learn the long-term effects of these chemicals. Andy Parati met with one group about their project that might be a model for others nationwide. Thank you, babe. Buckled. Callie Swafford takes us on the road near the North Georgia mountains in search of an essential resource, clean water. It's just what we've had to do and what we feel is like our, our best option. It's a 20 minute drive from her home outside Rome, Georgia in her minivan. You ready, baby girl? Let's go. A routine Callie says is necessary to ensure her family's drinking water is safe after the state discovered high levels of a cancer causing toxin in a river Rome used for its drinking water eight years ago. It feels very third world. Um, especially, like I said, when my daughter was a baby and I would have her strapped to my back and I'm 20 minutes away collecting water so that we can feel safer. To respond to the contamination, the city shut down its primary water intake facility in 2016 using another river for its water. It's also building a new multi-million dollar plant that will eventually remove the toxin. The chemical of concern Perfluoralkyl, or PFAS for short, used by carpet manufacturers upstream and deposited into the Ustanala River for decades, linked to high blood pressure, cancer, and birth defects. We don't know the complete like scope of how this will affect our bodies, how it will affect our babies. I just want to know. I just want to know, like, is there as much cause for concern as what is being presented? to find out. Looking at 54 minutes of flying time. We traveled hundreds of miles to a North Carolina city that uncovered a similar problem in its water in 2017. Our pleasure to welcome you to Wilmington. We have a local time of 1121. And how it took action could serve as a roadmap to how Georgia might respond. This is the Cape Fear River. It provides drinking water to the city of Wilmington and other communities. And just like the city of Rome, its source of contamination is upstream, linked to a company that dumped PFAS into its water for decades. Families and experts are still trying to figure out the impact of chemicals, including one group of chemicals known as PFOS. The levels in our drinking water are higher than the new minimum goal. Quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of, of quietness and silence. Everybody deserves a right to know what's going on. So this is the Northeast Cape Fear. Kim Burdett is head of the Cape Fear River Watch, an environmental watchdog group. Over 500,000 people were, were all impacted. They all found out on the same day that their drinking water supply was contaminated. It was contaminated by a toxic, dangerous compound and that there was nothing we could do about it. To measure the impact, Burdett and hundreds of Wilmington area residents took part in a study conducted by North Carolina State University to test their blood for the toxin. The results, it detected PFAS in almost everyone who participated, no matter where they lived. For death's blood among the most contaminated in the entire study. It's certainly shocking and certainly kind of terrifying. Sanjay Bedish is Kim's doctor. Which is alarming because it indicates that he is at much higher risk of certain medical conditions. So we worry about hypertension, we worry about kidney cancer, renal cancer, testicular cancer. Dr. Bittish's blood results also revealed high levels of PFOS. While concerned, he says the results arm him and his patients with important information on how to respond, including increased medical screenings to catch potential illnesses Early. Without that information, without the blood testing and urine testing to see what individual uh, levels are, you're just sort of driving blind. Kim's results hit close to home. His father died from kidney cancer last year, a disease directly linked to the toxin. Both drank Wilmington's water laced with PFOS 
for years. Do you feel like you have this ticking time bomb in your body and you don't know whether it's going to go off or not? Yeah, that, that is a, a very good description, a ticking time bomb. So every time I get a weird sensation, every time I don't feel great, and always in the back of my mind I'm going, well, you know, maybe that's kidney cancer or maybe that's testicular cancer. Back in Rome, Georgia, Callie wants a similar study conducted here. And then, she believes she and her neighbor's blood are already contaminated, but she won't be getting help from this state. The Georgia Department of Public Health telling us it does not have plans at this time to conduct testing in affected areas. This is like one of our favorite spots, isn't it? Residents looking for answers to learn how years of ingesting contaminated water may have impacted them in future generations. I think that calls for a health emergency, 100%. Want to take a deeper dive into some of our investigations? Read more of our team's work at investigatetv.com. Coming up, one of the most caught fish is causing a major battle in the Gulf. We look at the concern over industrial fishing and the turf war along the shore. Welcome back to Investigate TV. One of America's largest commercial fisheries brings jobs, profits, but boatloads of controversy. Sports fishermen and conservationists complain the state of Louisiana allows fishing on an industrial level close to shore. John Snell in New Orleans looks into the complaints and the pushback from the companies. On a fall morning, a little over a quarter mile off Schofield Island, the commercial fishing boat Kitty Wake eyes a school of Menhaden. The Menhaden fishery is the second largest commercial fishery in the U.S. And by far Louisiana's largest. Upwards of 500 million tons of Menhaden, or pogies, per year. More than shrimp, crab, and oysters combined. Right now it's like the Wild West out here. Pogies are also the focus of an ongoing dispute between the industry and sport fishermen, including complaints from both sides about the other frequently intruding on their space on the water. Two plants in Louisiana and one in Mississippi grind the fish into a protein powder used as feed for livestock and in aquaculture, or a raw fish oil that might end up in your dietary supplement. This right here is, this hurts me. This is a big, beautiful Louisiana bull red. Charter boat captain Eric Newman is among the critics concerned the boats scoop up more than just pogies. But you think they're too close? Yes, sir, I do think they're too close. I mean, I, in my opinion, I think there needs to be a bigger buffer zone. To haul in their catch, the pogie boats dispatch two smaller boats, which unfurl a 1,700-foot-long Persane net. They draw the ends together and fold the bottom of the net to capture the fish, which are vacuumed into the mother boat. Here in Louisiana, we've recently implemented on the west side of the river uh, a laughable one quarter mile buffer. We were outside of a quarter mile today and you can see the damage that's being done in, in those shallow areas. Everything out here eats pogies. Uh, dolphins eat pogies, sharks eat pogies, especially bull redfish this time of year. Over the last couple years, state lawmakers came close to placing tighter restrictions on pogey boats and limiting their catch, but the bills eventually died. It's a question of sharing the economic value of the coast. We believe there's nothing that we do that is challenging the livelihood of anyone. The two sides point to different figures when it comes to bycatch, but the numbers are in the 1 to 3 percent range. Those species that are caught as bycatch are typically not prized recreational fish, like it, it, it's more your croaker or your mullet. This is uh, what we refer to as a shark excluder. Pogey boat captain Mike Dameron says the bars on the end of the boat's vacuum hose and more narrow gaps up top prevent larger fish from entering the hold. We'll hit those series of bars and then be discharged back overboard to sea with the salt water, the seawater that's being sucked up by the pump. Even some fish that avoid getting sucked into the boat end up dying. There are no exact numbers. I have never seen them make a set, and I've seen them make a lot of sets where they didn't kill some big redfish. The redfish and speckled trout that we hear our critics say, it's really minute amounts compared to what 
recreational anglers are removing from the water. In late October, the pogey boats are wrapping up their season. You're coming out here and you're seeing these fish that are coming out here to breed, getting killed and thrown back in the water dead. It's really hard for the average guy not to have his stomach turned by seeing that. Again, you've got to look at the impact of the amount of redfish we do catch. And, and are they not fishing the redfish during the same time that these fish are spawning? The Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries Commission recently moved toward enacting stricter recreational limits on speckled trout amid signs the species numbers are dropping. I can tell you that there's no science that suggests that we are the cause of that. It's user conflict. People don't want to see the, the big bad commercial fishermen out there on the water. Commercial fishing built this, co this country. Dameron is a fourth generation captain in Vermilion Parish where the industry employs a few hundred people. Not just the, the families that, that work in the industry, but contractors, service companies. Overall, the industry says it creates roughly 800 direct jobs and pumps $500 million into the economy. The industry says it's already shrinking, one-third as many boats as in the 1980s. By pushing us out, they're going to challenge our economics. That will bankrupt us. Francois Cattell owns West Bank Fishing in southern Plaquemines. He says the disputed area closer to the shore amounts to 20% of their catch. We fish where we fish because that's where the fish is. Then there's the issue of the abandoned net. Last month, a pogey boat, not owned by Cattell, dumped an estimated 900,000 pounds of Manhattan near Holly Beach, most of them dead. And there's a regulation, which we support, we are not opposing, which will place an onus on us to make sure that incidents like that do not happen in the future, and if they do, that we are penalized. This is also, to a certain degree, a philosophical disagreement about Louisiana's coast and how we use it, about the relative lack of white sandy beaches and thousands of tourists. The Louisiana coastline is fundamentally different than those of, for example, Mississippi, where it is dotted with hotels from one side to the other. Our beaches are just as important, if not more important. Our beaches have all been restored with oil spill money. We've spent a billion dollars on restoring these beaches here in this part of the state. I know it's technically legal, but that doesn't make it right. Both sides talk of compromise, but that has proven elusive as the controversy over Louisiana's largest fishery rages on. Thanks, John. Want to hear more stories like this? Check out the Investigate TV YouTube page for our latest content and partnerships. Up next, long forgotten oil and gas wells spark environmental concerns. How one state plans to find and clean up these orphan wells after the break. Welcome back to Investigate TV. Researchers are searching for a specific type of environmental hazard hidden in plain sight. They're looking for old abandoned oil and gas wells that are polluting our soil, air, and water. Morgan Lowe in Phoenix explains. We found wells all over the state of Arizona that have been abandoned, many of them in rural areas, but some in places that are now highly populated. Officials want to seal them off, but first, they need to know where all of these wells are. Arizona is known for its natural beauty, not as a fossil fuel producer, but over the past hundred or so years, oil and gas speculators have come and gone, and they've left behind a dangerous relic. Open pipes sticking out of the ground, some leading down thousands of feet, now leaking gases, and polluting the surrounding areas. A lot of them are really old, and that's why they don't have owners. That's why they're not properly plugged in, abandoned. Daniel Chekolinski is the air quality director of the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. That agency received a $25 million grant from the federal government to find these wells and plug them. Based on a preliminary inventory, there's 246 orphan wells. But Chekolinski says that number could change. This is a map of the known orphaned wells. They're in cities and rural areas, and there are likely more of them. ADEQ is launching a new website where ordinary people can report wells they find. Environmentalists say they pose a real danger. 
some of the wells that we're aware of are already near places where there's drinking water supplies. Steve Brittle is the president of the nonprofit Don't Waste Arizona. He applauds the effort to find and plug the wells, but he says it's a symptom of a bigger problem. It's also another example of how we allow companies to come in and do this stuff, really create a type of environmental damage, and then they're gone. And the taxpayers ultimately bear the burden. Officials tell us it costs on average $50,000 to seal just one of these wells. Thanks, Morgan. Coming up, looking to make your home more energy efficient? Some improvements could be eligible for some tax incentives. We share how to find out what qualifies in this week's Watching Your Wallet. Welcome back to Investigate TV. The Inflation Reduction Act signed into law in 2022 created tax credits for clean vehicles in some home energy investments. So how do you know what qualifies? Rachel DePompa explains. If you're thinking about making your home more energy efficient or maybe you're looking at buying an electric vehicle, well, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 provides several tax credits and deductions that many experts say you should consider. The credits can help homeowners with the cost of replacing, say, a hot water heater, heat pumps, windows, doors, or even insulation. These credits are in place until 2032, so you have plenty of time to plan out your projects, according to Cherry Dale, a financial coach with the Virginia Credit Union. So if you're planning on doing it now or later, you want to look into the tax credits around that. I believe it's the $3,200 tax credit that they could get if they went and replaced that heat pump or you know windows or doors for their home. When you think of clean energy, your mind might automatically go to solar panels and there are some tax incentives that you can look into if you are thinking about adding them. There's a 30% income tax incentive around installing solar panels and solar energy, clean energy into your home. So if you're going down that path, you wanna make sure that you you know, take advantage of those tax incentives as well. That credit includes not only rooftop solar panels, but also wind energy, geothermal heat pumps, and battery storage. Again, most of these tax credits are available through 2032, and then they start to reduce in value in 2033 and 34. Thanks, Rachel. And that's it for us. Thanks for joining us here on Investigate TV. Hope to see you next week.